Hey everybody, Stephen Feuerstein back for another Foyer tip. We had an election in the United States yesterday. It wasn't a total disaster. Hopefully we'll, the Democrats will keep the Senate and the House and we will not lose democracy in the United States. But I got to admit, it's kind of hard to get pumped up, pumped up to talk tech when I'm looking at the world doing what? Wow. Okay, so I just want to say that as bad as the Republicans are, I'm more concerned about our media, New York Times, CNN, et cetera, making it clear that they thought a big red wave was coming. No, no, we just wanted to discourage Democratic voters, I guess. Okay, enough of that. My apologies, had to get a little bit off my chest. Uh, so what we're gonna do today is talk about PL SQL stuff, yay. Uh, and specifically what I wanna do is look at insert select statements and the floral statement, specifically in the context of, and please share my screen, Mark, a very famous mantra from Tom Kite. Um, if you're relatively new to Oracle, you may not be that familiar with Tom. So he was a legend, is still is a legend in the Oracle database world, retired in 2016. His work, the Ask Tom website, is being carried on by Chris Saxon and Connor McDonald, two developer advocates in the Oracle database team, amazing advocates that they are. Anyway, Tom coined a lot of mantras that are now commonly used in our community, including, it depends, which is a pretty good answer to almost any question that you ask. But also, specifically, you should do it in a single SQL statement if at all possible. Use SQL to the max. If you can't do that, all right, then do it in PL SQL. If you can't for some reason do it in PL SQL, you might consider doing it in a JavaScript procedure. And then because this quote is old, then we start talking about C external procedures. Now we could talk about doing it in JavaScript in the database. But the basic idea is that SQL is such a powerful, declarative, set processing oriented language that fits very well with data you should always do it in SQL first. I totally agree with this mantra. However, there are some situations, and I suppose it falls into that category of if at all possible, there are some scenarios where it simply doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the requirements of what you need to do. And I thought that insert select versus for all is a great example of that. So that's why I thought I'd focus on it today. So let's see, what I want to start off with is just looking at different ways of doing inserts. We actually did a FOIA tip recently on inserts. I'm not going to go into a, a whole lot of detail on this, uh, just to run through the insert select versus the for all. This is a script that's also available on Live SQL called for all inserts performance comparison. So you can run it yourself and try it out. But the bottom line, if we go back to SQL developers, that I, I compare looking at doing a straight row by row insert, 100,000 rows, a for all insert, an insert select from a nested table, an insert select with a direct path nested table. And then we come down to the standard insert select. So insert select is a really nice feature. Basically you can say, I've got a bunch of data in another table or 25 tables. I create a select statement that selects a set of values that will become the values in the columns and the rows of the table that I'm inserting into. So it's a very nice syntax. And it allows you to do some very high speed bulk inserts or transfers of data into a table. And, uh, and so I, I run all these different comparisons. I'll, I'll run it now. And we'll just take a look at the latest set of results. This is actually running on 21C. Uh, Live SQL is still running on 19C as far as I know. And I ran it this morning. And these are the kind of results you generally expect to see. So the for loop row by row, 100,000 rows, 118 centiseconds, hundreds of seconds, 1.18 seconds. For all, down to six centiseconds. Wow, that is pretty amazing. And then if we skip through some of these others, you can see that insert select, 100% SQL, five centiseconds. So in this particular run, it was a little bit faster than for all, but roughly the same. And I'm finding some really interesting results in my uh, running on 21C. I'm not sure what is going on, but we'll, we'll come back to that when it appears. But it seems like we would say, okay, insert select is simpler. It's just straight SQL. It seems to be the fastest approach to take. Why wouldn't we always do that when we've got data already in a set of tables that we want to transfer in to another table? Why not use insert select all the time? So there are two key things to remember about insert select. The first one is not specific to insert select. It's specific to SQL, which is that SQL statements are by and large and by default atomic. So that means that either all the rows get inserted or none of them get inserted. 
Now that's usually what you want. I'm running a single statement. If they don't all go through, then I don't want any of them to go through. There's something wrong I need to look at. Of course, in some cases, maybe that's not what you want and you run into some issues. The other thing to remember about insert select is that you can't do an insert select with a returning clause. If I want to get information back from the rows I've inserted, it's simply not supported yet. Maybe it will be soon. And those are the two main reasons I can think of where you would want to actually switch to for all. Let's see if my script finished. Wow, it hasn't finished yet. Very strange. So I've been seeing this very bizarre performance on a couple of the different steps in this one, running on my 21C instance. Uh, so I don't know what's going on with that. In fact, oh, it was waiting for a reconnect. Is it running? I think it's running. There we go. So I don't know what's going on, but you can see here it says for all 0. 0. 0.067 seconds. So roughly the same as you saw for 19C. And then insert select, eight seconds. Bulk collect for all, 11 seconds. I don't know what is going on. But um, pretty much if you, if you ignore the bizarre results that I've been finding there, in general, you'll see things like this. So this is one of the runs on 21C that made sense. You can see that insert select and for all. Actually, we're very fast. But what I've been finding on 21C when I don't find these totally bizarre results like I ran it again and now it's 17 seconds for insert select. Really no idea what's going on there. Um, what I was actually finding was consistently on 21C, the for all solution was actually consistently faster than insert select. So maybe that's one reason to use in, uh, for all going forward in 21 and 23 and whatever. Maybe for all is now the fastest way. Okay, but using for all is more complex, there's no question. Let's actually now look at a direct comparison of the two of them and talk about some of these specific elements. So in this script that I've got here, I'm gonna load up 199 rows into the My Parts table. Notice I've got some constraints here. The part name can be 100 characters long, big deal. The quantity sold, whoops, sorry, in the table, quantity sold is restricted to two digits of precision. In other words, you can't have a quantity greater than 99 because I want to force errors in this example. And so what I've done is inserted 100 rows into the table right up to 99. So I'd get no errors there or shouldn't. Got a little procedure to show the count, the number of rows in my table. And then I've got an insert and procedures. So this inserts the number of rows that I request. And what I'm going to do is insert select and I'm going to restrict the number of rows to that limit. And I'm doing it by the part number. Basically, I want to show what happens if I don't do anything that causes an error or what happens when you get an error. I'm also going to not look at any of the new rows that I'm inserting in. So I'm going to try to do an insert select, and then I'll show how many rows I inserted by checking the value of SQL row count. And I'll also look at the row count in the table. If something goes wrong, I'll let you know it was an error. I'll see what SQL percent row count then says. I'll show the error. OK. And then I've got another one. Let's all do all that first, then I'll show you the rest of it. So I'll run all of these steps. Feel free to put in any comments or questions you got along the way. Let's see what we get. OK. So ignoring my warning, uh, just but just a little point about that, it's a great warning. In my exception handler, I display a bunch of information, but I don't re-raise the exception. And, and P, the PL SQL team says, you know, that, that's potentially a problem. You're swallowing up your error. So we're going to warn you about that. And there are ways to turn this off and ignore it and so on. Uh, but anyway, moving on to the results from the inserting. So the first step was inserting 10 rows. Let's get that script back here first. 10 rows. Now, that means that the quantity ordered was set to maximum of 10. If I double that, which is what I'm doing here, I'm doubling 10 plus 10, that will not exceed 100. So that should be OK. And I look and I say, yes, I inserted 10 rows. And I now have 109 rows in my table. Cool. OK, then I pass in 49. 49 plus 49 is 98, which is still two digits of precision. So I was able to insert 49 rows. And it says 158. Cool. All right, now I try to do 50 and try to do 100. Each of these result in that part number doubling to more than two digits of precision. So it'll raise an exception. So what I see here now is I got an error. 
and the rows on the table are still 158. It hasn't changed. And you can see 158, 158. So this is an example of the all or nothing. Since it tried to do the entire insert selective, say 100 rows, it didn't insert any new rows because at least one of them had a problem. Now, here's a question for all of you who are looking at this. Here's a puzzle. I don't understand this. It says error. And then it says inserted 49 rows. I don't understand why it's saying that. So here's the insert statement. It failed. I came down here and it says that SQL percent row count is 49. Don't get that at all. Now, it could be that it's the SQL percent row count hasn't been changed because the insert failed. Let's do a show count first. That could be what it is. I just want to see if. So now I'm going to execute a SQL statement here. That should automatically reset SQL percent row count. Let's run the same thing again. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about in terms of the issue, but we'll, we'll go back over it. Um, okay, so let's see. There we go. So now we have rows in my part 99, then it goes up to 100, 100, and then SQL percent C is still C inserted in 49 rows. So if anybody has an idea, now this is 21C, maybe behavior has changed, but my understanding would have been that SQL percent row count at this point was zero because none of these rows were inserted. It seems like it's counting the number of rows that were inserted, even though they're not really in the table, which you can see because of show count, rows in my parts table, 158. So if anybody's got an answer to that one, let me know. So that's the problem with insert select. If, if it is certainly a situation of all or nothing, in other words, I might be inserting 10 million rows into this table from my 15-way view join of, of these other tables and pushing all to my new table, either all of them go in or none of them go in. In that case, insert select is perfect, unless you need to get information back. I'll come back to that next. But if you're in a situation where you're doing this bulk transfer of data and you want to get as much done as you can, and then go back and look at what didn't work and maybe fix some of the data and do another run, then insert select is not going to be very helpful to you. And that's where for all can come in really handy. So let's take a look at the next block of code. So now I've got insert n with for all. And I've got a nested table that I've got locally that I'm going to grab all the data in. So I'm getting all the data from the same query as before. All the values less than or equal to that part number, ignore all the new ones and I'm going to bulk collect them into this collection of object types. So this is a nested table of object types. So I construct the object type within the select statement, populate my collection, and then I have a for all statement that says, same insert statement, insert with specific values, get the part number, part name, quantity sold, inserted into the table. When I'm done, show me how many rows I inserted with SQL percent row count. And if something went wrong, Again, show me the super percent row count, count in the table, and the error. And I did run this the second time. So now if we look at that, let's see if it's any different. So we inserted 10 rows, so 99 went up to 109. Then we did the 49. Let's pull up that. We did the 49, and that said, great, no errors. Added 49 more to 158. Then I tried to do 50. I got an error. Now it's saying, I inserted 49 rows, and you know what? It really did insert 49 rows. So SQL percent row count is not only accurate, but we can actually see the results in the table. So in other words, it went through those first 49 rows. It was able to insert, insert, insert. It hit the 50th row, which had the quantity ordered set to 50, doubled it to 100, could not do anything, and stopped. In this case, it stopped. But all those previously inserted rows were still there to be committed. Same thing if I do 100. In fact, no matter how many, how many, uh, num no matter how big the number is past 50, we'll still get the same exact behavior. 49 rows inserted, and then it moved up to 256. So that's one of the key differences between for all and insert select. If you need to get that partial non-atomic result, then you'll definitely want to uh, switch to for all. Alternatively, you could do an insert select with a log errors. The log errors is an alternative to uh, to a for all with save exception. With it's a, it's the alternative to for all because if you add log errors, then at the row level, if an insert fails, instead of stopping, the SQL engine will continue going and will put information out to a log, error logging table. 
which we've talked about in the past, I don't really see too much of a difference in performance if you do the logging of errors. You may decide to do that instead of for all, but it looks like for all might give you better uh, performance actually, at least on the most recent versions of Oracle database, which is pretty cool. Okay. Now, one thing to note here is that because I didn't include save exceptions, I just want to say that I'm typing over my dog's muzzle. So if I make mistakes, it's all his fault. Because I didn't include save exceptions, the first time it hit a row that had an error or it attempted to insert a row that had an error, it stopped. The, uh, the for all engine didn't keep on going. If I include save exceptions, let's run it again. We should see exactly the same results, but it'll take longer, maybe a little bit longer. Now we see errors in array DML. You see that it added the, the, it's added the same number of rows as before. And that's because in this case, but we got a different error. And that's because in this case, it kept on going. Save exceptions basically said, don't stop. You're at the 50th row. It didn't work. Try 51, try 52, try 53. Of course, every one of those in this case failed. So every effort to insert those last 50 rows or 51 rows failed. But because I had save exceptions, it kept on trying. And then it filled up the SQL bulk exceptions array that I could iterate through and look at what actually went wrong with each one of those rows. In this case, it would all be the same. So the, the point here is that you don't have to use save exceptions to get to that, to get to insert as many rows as you can until you hit an error. You still get, you still break the atomic model that you get with insert select. The only question is whether you want to go all the way through every attempted row or stop on the first one. Either way, for all breaks that atomicity of your statement. And that, again, is something you either like or you don't like. Uh, let's see, no questions or comments so far? Wow, what a quiet group. Okay, and uh, the last thing I want hey, to- Hey, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Stephen. We do have a few questions and comments. I can okay. uh, display them on the screen if you want, just a second. Yeah, sure. Let's take a break from sharing my screen. And if you could stop sharing for a sec, so they don't have to see the, uh, there we go. So modern update, if you cannot do it in a single SQL statement, then call a REST API, which is simpler. That will do the SQL for you behind the scenes. Yeah, I, I, I think Judith is being sarcastic. Judith, I'm glad to see you're on this call. Hopefully you can either tell me what's weird about that SQL percent row count showing 49 rows, or maybe I'll pass the script to you to go explore. And Judith is a great uh, deep thinker and experimenter in Oracle database. So yes, I suppose the, the modern, <laughs> What has come up to now? Um, let's go back to the previous one first. Then we can take that. So it's true that I, I think for a lot of modern developers, especially let's say JavaScript developers, they don't want to deal with any SQL. And I totally support that feeling. Java developers shouldn't deal with any SQL. JavaScript developers shouldn't deal with any SQL. It should be left to database developers to do and expose through a PL SQL API or a set of predefined views that do all the work for them. Um, but even then, you'd probably want to hide it behind a REST API so that they can access those from JavaScript. So again, I'm not sure, Judith, if you were being somewhat sarcastic or not. There's actually nothing wrong with it in the sense that I think you'd still want to have the same SQL doing the work, but you'd expose that SQL through a REST API. The main thing being front-end developers, like JavaScript developers, should not have to deal with SQL. There's nothing wrong with them learning SQL and using it, but most of them don't learn it, don't want to use it, and are disdainful of it. And that's a bad formula for when you're writing code. Okay, next up. Oh, what about, no, let's go back to Ask Tom for a second. Then we'll look at that. What is Tom up to now? Uh, so, so Tom Kite retired in 2016. As far as I know, he just started camping a lot. He completely removed himself from the Oracle world, so far as I know, basically just completely disappeared. Uh, but as far as I know, he's doing well and hopefully enjoying his retirement. The good news is that Ask Tom didn't suffer at all. Ask Tom has gotten better and better since Tom stopped because we know of two people doing it, Connor and Chris, and they're both really aces uh, in, in the Oracle database world. Okay, next question, or, or Judith. So in live SQL, it works correctly. Cod, that would be strange. Okay, let's, so you're saying that you didn't see the, you, that SQL percent row cap came up zero in, in live SQL? We're gonna try that in a sec. So next, anything else besides those? So great point by Graham, as I, as I was mentioning, the REST API is really no different logically than putting the PL SQL API around your SQL. The main thing is to basically build out an, a, a, as complete a, 
a, an API as possible to your data, underlying data. So you can control it, you can, you can optimize it, you can secure your data and make it easier for those front-end developers. Thanks, Ram. Anything else? And certainly when you're doing major, major amounts of DML on big tables, so I can write a SQL statement like insert a million rows or update a million rows. It's really easy to write the statement logically. Getting it to run to completion could be quite problematic. So if your rollback segments aren't big enough, you can roll out of, roll out of run out of rollback segment space, in which case what you usually do is contact your DBA and ask for bigger segments, or you have to go into incremental commit processing, which is another way of breaking the atomicity of your SQL statement. I'll do a thousand at a time and then commit, which is often very problematic for applications. But you know, we do what we need to do to get it to work. Anything else? Oh, try this. I, I'm not sure what that, why I will try that, but let's, so let's stop sharing uh, let, or sh start sharing my screen. Let's get this script here. No, this one here. Let's run it in live SQL. I think I'm logged in. Still logged in, start coding. And we'll just do that one. Hopefully this will just all work. Let's see. Something worked, something happened. So I'm seeing the same thing, Judith. I'm seeing inserted 49 rows. This is the this is the SQL percent row count. So I don't see a difference right now uh, between the two. Let's see what, I'll read that question, comment, insert into. Okay, that, so that's too much code for me to deal with. Judith, send it along to me afterwards and I'll take a look and I can report it perhaps in the, in the blog post that goes with this, with this uh, session. But I don't see in my script uh, that SQL percent row count is doing anything differently. And again, if any of you have a thought on this, I thought it was weird, but maybe I'm just wrong that this SQL percent row count should not be telling me that we got to 49 rows and then we had to stop. But maybe I never understood insert select thoroughly. Maybe I just learned about insert select. Right, so it does fail at that 50th row because we're doubling the, so I, it's a very contrived example. Since I set the quantity sold precision to be two, as soon as we double 50, and when I do my insert select, I'm doubling the part number so the part number for, actually it should be quantity ordered, but it's the same, so it doesn't matter. This should actually be quantity sold. These are both set to the same value. So this is actually some pretty funky code. This should be quantity sold plus quantity sold, but it's all the same. So it's 50 plus 50 goes to 100, three digits of precision, and then it causes the failure. Okay, so, um, so, okay, let's talk about returning then, and I think we'll be done, which is good because I'm already through a lot of the uh, half hour. So probably one of the most important reasons to use for all versus insert select has to do with needing to get information back from your, from your statement. Uh, I think the second, maybe the second or third forward tip I ever did was on the returning clause. Love it. It allows you to get information back from the SQL statement you just executed, avoiding another context switch. And if I'm doing something like this uh, with a for all statement, I've got an update and my update has returning, then I can say returning bulk collect into, and it will bulk collect all the values that I'm, and I can get multiple values back, play ID, last name, et cetera. But I can basically get all the different IDs for the new rows if I was doing, doing inserts or the IDs of the rows that were modified. And then I can iterate through them. So for example, suppose that the rule on my mass bulk update was every single row I update or I attempt to update, every single attempt to update, so every statement executed for a different bind variable in this array should update at least one row. Now, how am I gonna make sure that's the case? I could write some complicated SQL to verify it or I add the returning bulk collect and I find out, oh, actually, that's actually percent bulk count, which is bulk row count, right? Um, 
Right. If I wanted to find out how many rows were modified for each one of those rows, I can use the SQL percent bulk row count to say, what's the number of rows modified with each statement? This would allow me to simply record that these rows were the ones modified, and I could grab those IDs and pass them on for future use. So uh, you go ahead and stop sharing my screen, please. So just to sum up, kind of conceptually, I love Tom's mantra. It's clearly the right way to go. We should do as much as we can in pure SQL. And if we can't do it in SQL, the idea is not to jump out to Java or JavaScript or something. I wouldn't even say outside of the database. All those things can be in the database now. But you want to use the language that is as closely tied to the database as possible for simplicity, for performance, for security. That's why you jump out to PL SQL. And from there, you'd look at some other really bizarre alternatives like JavaScript. Um, so it's a great mantra. The thing is, I don't want you or me to get too hung up on the mantra, by which I mean, some of us aren't great at SQL. Some of us really struggle to write more complex SQL statements. And you might be writing something really complicated to put that insert select together. And you might say, wow, I can't even get it to work. Don't feel bad if you have to fall back on PL SQL because it's more straightforward procedural logic can be easier to deal with in some cases. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. And depending on your application requirements, I need to break the atomicity of the SQL statement, or I need to get that information back from my bulk insert or bulk updates. So I need to use that uh, returning clause. Those are all good reasons to switch to for all. And as you can see, at least in the later versions of the database, you definitely do not pay a performance penalty. It's right up there with insert select, which I think is such an impressive feat for the PL SQL engine and the integration between PL, SQL, and SQL. Um, and I think that pretty well covers it. So just remember to be flexible. Don't worry about you know, following mantras too severely. Uh, the, bottom, the bottom line is getting the work done and not having a really stressful time doing it. OK, so that's the end of my technical talk. Any other questions or comments, Mark? The connection reset thing in SQL development. <laughs> So, I mean, the fact that the, the connection times out, I don't think that SQL developer so much. I think it's the sessions I'm connected to. Like if I was doing Oracle Cloud, I am running against, I think, the private cloud account at Insum. Uh, but I think it's the cloud timeouts that are mostly doing that. And you're right, extremely annoying, yes. Though today it wasn't as bad as I'd seen it previously. Um, so love to hear from any of you if you think that you can figure out the SQL percent row count. Uh, Hello, Graham. Thanks for uh, greetings from Singapore, I believe. And the election is going OK. Uh, to, put, to put it in the, to quote the most despicable politician in the United States, Greg Abbott, reelected as governor. It could be worse. That's his quote after the Evaldi school massacre when his heavily militarized police could not manage to break into the room and stop the killings. Could have been worse. So it could have been worse. I'm hopeful that we will not me making it a lot worse. Anyway, yes, disaster is happening all over the world. As I say, it's nice to be able to retreat into our world of cyberspace to escape from some of that awfulness. I just find it harder and harder to do. And look, I'm making it through this entire session, and I'm not even going to talk about Elon Musk and Twitter. But next time, next time might be different. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I don't have a cultural artifact to offer to you. Actually, my feeling right now is I'm not into culture, I'm not into human culture, I'm into being outdoors. So my cultural artifact I would give to you is just go outdoors as much as you can, be in contact with your planet as much as you can, take your children outdoors as much as you can and you will all benefit greatly from it. So happy coding, thanks for joining me today. Hopefully you picked up a couple of useful tips and I should see you in a couple of weeks. Take care everybody.